people in the life of the people of God. So here we will look at uh, these different aspects wherein we use the Bible in the life of the church. The Bible and the liturgy, the Bible and prayer, especially Lectio Divina, and then the personal reading of the Bible. Although we are accused of not being so familiar with the Bible, but most of our liturgical celebration are filled with so many things from the Bible. So anyway, during the liturgical celebrations, we feel in a special way our being church or community. So these gatherings are the privileged occasions during which Christians come in contact with the living and efficacious Word of God. According to Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Vatican document uh, on liturgy, number seven, it says there, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. So that's Sacrosanctum Concilium. And here's another one from the from the Verbum number 21. It says, the church has always venerated the divine scriptures just as she venerates the body of the Lord. Since especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table of both God's word and of Christ's body. So from these citations, we can see how very much connected the Bible is to the liturgy. You can never imagine a liturgy without a word of God being read in it, or even the wordings of the liturgy basically has resonance with the scriptures. So when the word is proclaimed in the assembly, our belief is that it becomes the living word of God, ik et nunc, meaning here and now. So that's why it's important to bear that in mind. When the word of God is proclaimed in our liturgical celebrations like the Mass, Right then and there, that proclamation of the passage that you're reading, that text that you're reading becomes the living word of God right then and there. That's why we cannot emphasize enough how, it, how important it is for lectors, for even for deacons, for priests, to be able to read the texts well, especially the gospel. I think it's important that as, as ministers later on, you read, we should read the gospel very clearly and in a way that people will understand it. Sometimes the priest will hurry reading the gospel and then would make, would make extra effort to come up with a beautiful homily, which is not supposed to be the case. The homily is only there to support the word of God. The proclamation of the word of God is the one that is much more important. That's why even if people would not get anything from your homily, as long as they understood when you proclaim the word of God, at least they have something to go on. Because otherwise, sometimes in our homilies, we only leave them with uh, jokes here and there. And then they forget about the word of God because we try to entertain them. So let's should, let, let us be clear about it. The very fact of proclaiming the word of God, whether by the lectors or by the by the deacons or the priests, these are already like proclamation of the word of God. Right then and there, the text that is being read becomes the living word of God. So we said already earlier that Catholicism is not religion of the book, that means of the Bible. We don't carry the Bible with us every, every time we go to our liturgy. But we are not individuals who read the Bible and understand it all on our own. In the context of the Protestant uh, communities or churches, sometimes people would uh, bring the Bible, read the Bible on a personal level, on an individual level, regardless of whether it appeals to the family or to the community. But in the context of the Catholic Church, we basically uh, read, interpret, and apply basically the Bible in the context of our community being a church. So we are a religion of the living word of God. So we gather together in assembly 
to hear and be nourished by God's living word. So we show this externally in the Holy Mass. When the readings are being proclaimed to us, we do not read together with the lector our own Bibles or missalets, scarrets, that we have missalets, so that people will pay attention and then really try to concentrate to be able to listen clearly to what is being proclaimed. Okay, because that is our way of basically getting in touch with the Word of God. So we listen to the proclamation. So the proclamation of the text is very, very important for us to consider. But most of the times in our experience, sometimes when someone reads, for example, the readings, sometimes we don't pay attention. We don't exert effort to listen. That's why the readings would be finished and then at the end of it, we realize what was read again? Which book did, was it taken from? Even in the gospel, sometimes we also do that, especially when we are distracted. The reading and the proclamation of the gospel would be fit, would be would end, and yet we are we are we don't know we don't realize that uh, we don't remember basically the message that was uh, that was uh, proclaimed unless we are preparing unless we prepare really for it. So that's why we have to listen to the proclamation. We have to make sure we have to make sure that in the proclamation, uh, people are really encouraged to really concentrate very well to be able to pick up that. Uh, basically what is being proclaimed because right then and there you are listening to the word of god being proclaimed so the faithful who actively participate in the celebrations cannot but be more meaningfully exposed to the bible but this is our way of being exposed to the bible is that clear do you have any questions so our our tradition teaches us that even if we don't bring Bibles with us every time, but in our celebration when it is proclaimed, right then and there in that proclamation, the text that is being read is precisely is precisely the word of God for us for that particular day. So it is the living, it is the living word of God. Now the second the second point that I would like to mention here is the is the relationship between Bible and prayer. So a prayerful reading of the Bible disposes us to hear God's word properly and more sensitively, not only with our eyes and mind, but also with our heart and spirit. In prayer meetings, that is what we do. That's the reason why sometimes we read the text twice or even thrice, just to be able to really allow the word of God to penetrate, to allow the word of God to touch us. So that's the kind of disposition that we should have towards reading the text. Because in itself, by reading the text prayerfully, we already go into prayer. We lift our consciousness, our hearts to God. And in the process, we are able to more or less resonate with what the text is saying. And eventually, we respond to it by maybe praying for specific things in our lives or commit, committing ourselves to doing something in response to the uh, gospel that was read. So the not only is prayer the atmosphere of our reading of the bible so that's why when you are in a prayerful disposition when you read the bible you become reflective but we also have to realize that prayer is our response to the word of god so when the word of god is proclaimed like in the mass or in a prayer meeting we should be able to hear it very clearly and understand it and reflect on it so that we could actually come up with a response that is appropriate to the invitation to the challenge of the text of the, of the word of God uh, that is presented before us. As St. Ambrose wrote, he says, we speak to him when we pray. We hear him when we read the divine sayings, which basically means when we read the scriptures. It's taken from his uh, writings on the duties of ministers. So, what he's saying is, when we pray, we speak to God. When we hear him, we hear him basically when we read the scriptures. Because sometimes in the reading of the scriptures, there we, found, there we find basically the response of God and what we need to do in response to our prayer. So the Bible is also a great help to our prayer, not only because it occasions our prayer, it provides the context for our praying, but also because we learn to pray because there, there in the Bible, we find great examples of people who pray. And so we are taught how to pray. So it, that means 
we are not only taught with regards to uh, uh, what we call this, uh, he listening to the word of God in a context of prayer, but the Bible itself provides us with words, provides us with disposition and attitudes towards prayer. Moreover, the Bible is a great treasury of prayers. The Psalms, for example, you have 150 of them there. We use that in our breviary and we pray it day in and day out these Psalms. These are prayers that we use in the context of our own daily lives. And then also the prayers of famous biblical figures. We're talking about the, for example, the Canticle of Zechariah, the Canticle of Mary, the Canticle of Simeon. So the the, we call this the blessing of uh, the prayer of blessing of Aaron and so on. So there are a lot of uh, prayers of famous people that we have adapted and we have used basically in, as uh, the same words for our own prayers as well. The very prayer that Jesus taught us, basically the Our Father. Ba these are basically what God wants us to pray. I always tell people that if there is any important prayer, that we could even have, I mean, in terms of uh, vocal prayer, we, the Our Father is actually the most important one because it has been taught to us by Jesus. And besides, it is it has a very clear structure where we are, we see basically what what how we basically look at prayer, who is who is basically on top, and what would be in terms of prioritizing what would come first and then what would come. In the and you notice in the Our Father that it all starts with our relationship with God. How we worship God, how we recognize that He is the only one that matters to us, and how we should obey Him, and how we, we should we should make sure that His will is the one that is realized in life. Because that's that's the most important thing for us. And then the rest will just follow. Even our daily needs will just follow. And of course, there is also a need for us to mend our relationship with one another, because that's fundamental to it. And of course, we ask not to be led into temptation, to uh, basically into hell. So things like that. So it's a, a very beautiful prayer. So these prayers have been echoed in the church for centuries. That's why it has already it has already reached even up our time. We are practically more than two thousand years already after all of these things have been written down, and we still use them today. So in the Bible, we not only discover the Word of God for us but we also learn the words that he wants to hear from us in prayer. So sometimes we don't know what to say, but uh, at least these prayers from the Bible will provide us with words like the Our Father. Lastly, in the scriptures, we find solid teachings on prayer, ways to follow and to avoid when we pray. Uh, you have Isaiah, you have Matthew, you have James, even the Gospel of Luke has many of those who tell us. Like, for example, praying, when you want to pray, don't pray in public places, you go into your room so that you don't brag about the fact that you pray. You basically try to hide it, and things like that. So when you pray, and when you're, for example, in a liturgy, like in a celebration, then you remember that someone is hurting because of what you have done. So you are asked to leave your offering, and then go get reconciled first, and then go back. So things like that. So there are a lot of, of ways of uh, praying that is uh, being asked of us. And there are still some other passages that explains to us the dynamics of prayer. Persistence in prayer is actually encouraged. That means we should not stop praying. So pray without ceasing. Because uh, at some point, God will actually grant us. Uh, if we show basically how much we need all those things that we pray for in our lives. So though you can find so many teachings on prayer in the in the bible particularly in the gospels especially in the gospel of Luke as well. now another tradition of prayer that we have that started with uh, in the monasteries is what is called lectio divina i'm not sure if you're familiar with this one so basically the the words is lat is latin and basically it just means the div reading divine or divine reading so lectio is reading or proclamation, if you wish, and then divina is uh, divine. So one way of praying and reading, reading and praying the Bible is lecture divina, and this lecture divina is a careful reading of the scriptures, with no view of satisfying intellectual curiosity, but rather of nourishing the life of faith. 
So you keep on repeating the reading of the text, not so much to understand it because you already understand it, but to be able to be nourished by just listening to the words that is being proclaimed in the text. So the inner disposition is determined by the heart's thirst to drink from the living waters of the world to satisfy the vital need for happiness and salvation. You read basically the text, not so much for what you can get out of it in terms of knowledge and understanding and provide curiosity, uh, satisfy the curiosity of your intellect, but to be able to feel life, to feel the spirit, to reinvigorate it by, the, by the just he hearing basically the word of God. That's basically what's uh, intended in the lecture video. So it is defined as the word made prayer. Not the word made flesh, but the word made prayer. A deep listening to the Bible cannot but transform itself into prayer. So every time you read the Bible, you cannot avoid being placed or being invited into a situation of really praying, of quiet and so on. So the believer spontaneously feels the need to respond to the God of love who reveals himself and speaks through the Holy Scriptures. That's why uh, we mentioned in the, when we discuss about the inspiration, one of the things that the church fathers would say about the Bible, he said it's the love letter of God. So if God wrote you a letter, and it is basically in the whole of scriptures, then we have to respond to it. How do we respond to God? Uh, by uh, to the love letter that he sent us. And that's basically what, what we need to do after being inspired by the scriptures. So the steps of Lectio Divina are few and simple. In fact, they are the natural stages that we follow whenever we read a text prayerfully. So these stages are the following. We start with the Lectio, with the prayerful reading of the text. So sometimes we read it once, twice, or even thrice, just to be able to get into it, to get into the spirit of the prayer. Then what the next stage is what is called Meditatio. We are familiar with meditation. That's basically what we do. Meditate or think over the text that we, are, that we have read. And then somehow we get some inspiration. We get some lessons. We get some uh, spiritual uh, nourishment. By the, way. the next stage is oratio, which is praying the text. So the attitude and type of prayer depend on what the text dictates. So we are just responding to the text. So if the text is happy, then definitely we are happily thanking and worshiping God for us. If the, if the text tells us about some bad things like calamities and so on, then of course the response is to ask God for, to stop it or to help us or to support, uh, to support us and so on. So it's the text that is uh, dictating what kind of prayer that we should have. And finally, <laughs> The most important one, I mean, of course, the highest point that maybe in our lifetime, we don't know if it will happen because it can only happen with the grace of God, is contemplatio, contemplation, where one leaves off active prayer and allows oneself to be taken over by God in a passive prayer. Uh, there are a lot of saints that have already experienced this. Of course, the more well-known ones are, are Teresa of Avila, for example, and then, of course, uh, who, who else? The one who was with him. Uh, so there are so many of them. When you the see, John of the Cross, John of the Cross uh, Joseph of Copertino, when, when, when they are praying, for example, these are people who, because they are contemplating already in the, before God, these are the people who levitate, who, who rise up, who, who basically uh, are uh, these are being raised above uh, the ground. So these are indications of contemplation. So of course it's, a, it's something that is, that is worth uh, desiring and we really have to also work it hard to be able to reach that. But in the end, these are just basically uh, grace of God, grace of God for us. So those are the stages of the lecture divine. Sometimes we only reach up to meditatio or oratio it's uh, not everybody actually reaches uh, contemplation in, with regards to lecture divina. So you can actually make that habit. 
of reading the text of the Bible, and then just go through the stages here and there. Uh, and you'll be able to realize that in time, you'll get used to it, and then eventually that becomes already part of who you are. So as we can see, the Lectio Divina is made up of two parts. Reading the Bible attentively and religiously, that's one, especially during which the believer listens to the voice of the Heavenly Father who speaks to us very intimately. And then, of course, the second one is the response of the believer in prayer, what they need to respond. So the Word is God coming down among us. So we respond by allowing ourselves to be lifted up to God, to be carried away by Him in prayer. So this is basically our response to the prayer. So we, we, whether we allow the Word of God to speak to us, to challenge us to do something in our present life, or it can actually like lift us up or carry us, carry us away and then just basically forget about everything and we are brought into the, into the presence of God in a way that is uh, not usually experienced in our day-to-day -day life. So that's, that's what Lecture Divina can actually uh, uh, offer us especially in prayer, in the praying of the text. Now the third one, which is the last one, is the personal reading of the Bible. Vatican II encourages all to read and study the Bible frequently that they may acquire the excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's from Philippians 3.8. So the reason why we need to study the text is to come to a knowledge that is excellent with regards to Jesus. That's Philippians 3.8. Since according to St. Jerome, ignorance of scriptures is ignorance of Christ. So as Christians, this is something that is, that is, not, that, that is no longer discussed. This is not something that is already like uh, you have to be consulted about. This is actually what it means to be a Christian. That our knowledge of Jesus is such that we almost basically are like living out the very spirit of Christ itself. And if we don't read the scripture, if we don't reflect on them, our own knowledge of who Jesus is in our life is impoverished. So it's not something that will help us grow in our faith if we, if we fail in our obligations, especially with reading of the scriptures. So our personal reading and study of the Bible would serve as preparation, deepening, and personalization of that word that comes to us in the liturgy. That's why we are always encouraged that before we go to Mass, we should actually be able to already read the readings. So that when we are there, it has its purpose. Like it deepens our own appreciation and it basically helps us to continue to reflect on the text. And at the same time, it provides us already with an information on what basically the readings that we have. In case lang na you get distracted and you, you fail to basically understand the, what was being proclaimed, at least you know basically what is uh, the readings of uh, for that particular Sunday. So that's basically what, what is uh, important. So we will profit from more from our encounter with Christ in his living word if we are prepared and allow it to take root in us by our personal effort to appreciate it. So hindi lang yung pupunta ka, you just go to the Mass and then just expect the Mass to maybe give you a very a uh, very uh, beautiful experience of a miraculous experience of being able to you know sometimes you have to do, do your your work so uh what you call this grace is built is built on nature so we must have to uh, show effort to prepare ourselves and then the rest will that will just take care of it on the matter of studying the scriptures we could learn very much from the jews because see for the jews the torah for israel is the expression of God's eternal love for his people. So in the rabbinical world, the study of the Torah is regarded as an integral element of religious life. It is part of their tradition. In fact, I, in fact, for the male, it is part of uh, what they have to go through, like uh, uh, part of their initiation into the real life, in the religious life. They have to go through some, some activities that focuses on like memorizing the text of the Torah. So here, of equal value to other forms of religious practices, uh, that's basically considered, I mean, the reading and then the study of the Torah. So the duty to study the Torah embraces everyone. So no one can abstain from studying it. 
it can never be reserved for nor delegated to some elite group. In our context, some fathers or some parents will say, or oh, they will tell their children, you just go to mass and you, you say, you attend mass for us. You cannot do that because no one can substitute for yourself. So if this is basically the attitude of the Jews towards the Torah, I think the same attitude is expected of us as Christians in relation to the, to the Bible, especially the Gospels. So it's not, it's not an option. So that means if you are not reading the text, if you are not reading the Bible at some point, then we are not doing basically our duty to be able to nourish ourselves with the Word of God daily in our lives. Okay? So, so much weight is given to the study of the wisdom and knowledge. So to study that wisdom and knowledge far outweigh nobility of birth for the Jews. One of their sayings goes like this. It is better to be a wise bastard than an ignorant chief priest. Anyway, you can just figure out what basically what is meant by it. So what is still important is that you you are you are you are you become wise and learned because of your encounter with the word of God. So if we could just approximate even just a little bit of this kind of attitude by the rabbis towards the Torah with regards to our Bible, we would no doubt experience what the church teaches. And I think many of our believers would probably be living on uh, basically what the Bible is saying about this. So let me just end with this saying from the quotation from Dei Verbum, the Second Vatican Council document on Revelation, number 21. It says, the force and power in the word of God is so great that it stands as the support and energy of the church, the strength of faith for her children, the food of the soul, the pure and everlasting source of spiritual life. So that's basically the power of the Word of God. Its support, it is the support and energy of the church. It is the strength of faith for us. And then the food of the soul, the pure and everlasting source of spiritual life. So if you want to become holy, one of the means that could have probably help you is basically reading the scriptures and that's basically what they were been wants to tell us especially with this quotation okay so